Good morning. We're about to finish up creation and evolution, and uh, we've been here about 12 weeks. I think it's probably the 13th week. And so what we want to do today is just sort of summarize. Now, I did bring a couple more fossils back. I brought one back I didn't have with me last week. I brought a fern back, and I brought the trilobite back, but I also brought back a seashell that is fossilized in solid rock. And this seashell uh, is still hinged together when it was fossilized. And not only is it still hinged together, but it has a slight gap in it that's now been filled with, with rock. And this gives evidence of having been caught very quickly while it was feeding and very quickly covered up and fossilized. Now, if you turn this rock around, you'll find other fossils in it also. Very nice. There was a gigantic conch right here or something, some shell. And evidently the people who uh, picked this up, you know, took this and threw this down. This came off of a beach in Mexico and you can see another shell fossilized over here. If you'd break this uh, rock apart, you would probably find many, many fossils in it. And so what we want to do is just pass it around and it is heavy. It's uh, solid rock, so it is heavy. So I thought you might enjoy seeing a fossil that had to have been made very, very quickly. That it could not have been a slow process of a, of a seashell laying there and over tens of thousands of years of a buildup of uh, sediment around it and then hardening and solidifying and then the replacement of the actual shell uh, material with mineral material. And that's supposed to be the process of fossilization. And, but this gives evidence of very rapid, quick, burial, and fossilization. And that's about the only way you can get a fossil. Uh, it's very difficult for me to perceive how you can get a fossil over long periods of time by substituting mineral for the actual, uh, the actual structure of, of the thing that you're fossilizing. In fact, some dinosaur bones are being found, and part of the bone is not fossilized at all. It's still bone. And from that bone, uh, they're talking about trying to get some uh, mitochondrial DNA or something out of the bone. Well, if they find any DNA whatsoever in any of these so-called fossils, uh, that's a sure sign it's not a fossil over long periods of time because uh, this material will not last more than a few thousand years in, in the state of being unfossilized. And I've never heard of fossilized DNA. You know, this, this has to be material that, that's still viable, you know, still chemical chemically sound, it still has to have its phosphate and sugar chains and still has to have its base groups, four base groups. And we looked at that a little bit. But now let's look at a summation here of life. What we have here is life as we know it here on earth. The source of all energy for earth is the sun. The sun has a set amount of mass and that mass is uh, uh, acting like a thermal nuclear furnace. In other words, there are literally millions and millions of thermal nuclear, I don't want to call them explosions, but it's a chain reaction, a big nuclear furnace. And that thing is tremendously hot and puts off a lot of energy. And this energy shines out through the space and fights its way down to Earth. And it shines through green leaves. Now, green leaves have chloroplast in them. And when this uh, light energy at two different wavelengths, it has many wavelengths, this light does, but at two particular wavelengths shining through this green leaf, it activates uh, things that happen in a, a little disk inside the chloroplast. Now the chloroplast, uh, they're a unit of the cell. You know, you have a living cell, you have a cell membrane, you have uh, cytoplasm, which is the uh, constituency inside of the cell that everything is suspended in. You have a nucleus, and in the nucleus, you have your genetic material. And out floating in this cytoplasm, you have uh, what's called uh, uh, in a plant chloroplast and mitochondria and all that. Now, you get to an animal cell, they do not have chloroplast. And that's the difference between plants and animals. Animals do not have chloroplast, and uh, plants have chloroplast. It's because chloroplast can use these wavelengths from the sun when it's shining through the leaf at certain wavelengths it activates these, looks like stacks of coins inside of the chloroplast. If you look at a microscope, it looks like they're a stack of coins. 
And uh, what happens is that you pull up water from the roots of the plant. And the water comes up and gets in the leaf. Now on the underside of the leaf, the CO2 that we breathe out, in other words, we breathe in oxygen, we breathe out CO2. The CO2 we breathe out goes in the leaf in the underside of the leaf through openings. And it meets with the water coming up from the roots and the carbon dioxide meets there in the area of these chloroplasts with the sun shining through it during daylight hours at certain wavelengths and it converts this CO2 and this water into uh, sugar. C6H12O6 is a basic uh, molecule for sugar. And that sugar then is used as energy to keep the leaf alive, keep the branches and twigs alive, to keep this uh, tree alive and is stored in the roots for wintertime when the sap goes down and the tree is in a dormant state. And so all of this whole tree here's life depends upon getting a certain amount of sunlight to shine through its leaves, a certain amount of CO2 and a certain amount of water. And that's how you make sugar. Now you have a light reaction and a dark reaction. You have the light reaction takes place only in daylight. The dark reaction takes place uh, in, I think daylight or dark either one, but they uh, predominantly in, in the dark. And so the leaves out there, all green plants are out there working for us to produce sugar. Now, if this is an apple tree, this sugar is transferred from the leaf, goes down the twig and comes out here out this branch, goes down inside and uh, becomes the, the part of the apple that we eat. And so we're actually eating what is made in the leaves of the tree or the bush or the shrub or whatever. And, uh, you know, so you can see the source of all food. Every, all food begins with energy from the sun. And so you can see that the energy from the sun is our external energy force because we know that uh, we've talked already here about the laws of thermodynamics. And the first law of thermodynamics states there's only so much mass and so much energy. In other words, the sun only has a certain mass and it puts out a certain amount of energy and it does it constantly. But this energy that the sun's putting out, every time that it's putting any energy out, which is all the time, uh, there's always some heat lost, uh, some energy lost in the form of heat that's never usable or attainable again. That's like striking a match. When you strike a match, you burn up that uh, matchstick and you uh, ignite those chemicals that's on the end of it. It causes it to ignite and it puts out a little flame and it burns and you lose uh, energy there in the form of heat. You still have the ash. You have the residue from the smoke that comes off. It's uh, almost uh, microscopic and falls to the ground and all that. But there's some of that match that uh, has become heat energy. And once you expend that heat energy, it can't go back. It can't flow the other direction and be restored. It is lost forever, you might say. And of course, we know it's lost until uh, the Lord restores or changes this particular law of, of, uh, of physics. Well, the same token, you have a plant over here, and guess what? When the plant takes the light from the sun shining through the chloroplast in the leaves, and it takes our CO2 and water from the soil, and it makes sugar, it also makes a waste product. And guess what that waste product is? It's oxygen. And of course, we utilize the oxygen. And the worm does, and the turtle does, and the fish do, and the walkers on all fours and the fowl of the air. See, I've here represented in this picture are the creepers, the crawlers, the flyers, the swimmers, and mankind. So all the creation kinds are represented here. And uh, so you can see that uh, that photosynthesis then is the buildup process of taking things and winding up with sugar. And so this is a capturing of energy, whereas cellular respiration is the expenditure of in energy. All plants and all animals, all living things uh, practice cellular respiration. Uh, even plants have cellular respiration, but they carry on photosynthesis in addition to that. Now here's the question. You see the system here, and you see the balance that's between plants and animals. One can't live or exist without the other. So the question is, which evolved first? Now. I think you can see, they say, well, they both evolved simultaneously. Well, now, that's, uh, that, the odds there are getting pretty big. Now, they had to evolve simultaneously at the exact same place, 
in the exact same balance to be able to work out this cooperative uh, mechanism here for the survival of each. Well, how did they live until they evolved the photosynthesis and evolved the respiration? You see, this is the very pertinent question about life. Where did life come from? And to the evolutionist, the living comes from the non-living. And then the next thing is, where did this sun come from? Because it had to have a birth date. It had to have a startup date. It had to have a date that it, it, it ignited and it was a fireball putting off this heat energy. Because we know for a fact it's going to burn out because of the first law and second laws of thermodynamics. There's only a limited amount of mass and energy. And for every reaction that occurs, especially in chemistry, for a natural occurring reaction from left to right, uh, then there's heat, uh, loss, heat energy lost in the form of heat that's never used or attainable again, which means this is going downhill, second law of thermodynamics. And uh, you say, well, we just pump in some external energy from uh, all from other suns. We'll just, we, we can get energy from other suns. Maybe we can have a collision. Uh, maybe a star gets out of place and it collides with this sun and they combine together and now they can start over. But now all you've done, all you have done here is to transfer this energy from an external source, another star or, or a comet or something like that. Now where does it get its energy from? You see what you have going there? Somewhere, eventually, you have to get to a point where everything started. And, of course, the evolutionists, they like to refer to this as Big Bang. But even Big Bang is not getting something from nothing. Big Bang was where that you had all these uh, hydrogen atoms. Billions, trillions, quadrillions, septillions, biggest number you can write. You can start over here at this end of the room and put a, a nine and a comma and start adding zeros or put as big a number as you want over here, put a 999. Put 999 over there, a comma, and write zeros all the way the length of this room and go around the walls and come back around the wall and start climbing the walls in a spiral and keep writing zeros all the way to the top of the ceiling here. And that's about how many, probably, hydrogen atoms you'd have to have for Big Bang if Big Bang could have occurred. But in the first place, even if you had those hydrogen ions, atoms, you can't explain where they came from. They couldn't just invent themselves. How can, how can you get something to occupy nothing? See, if there's not anything in existence, that means there's no space to be occupied. If I have space that can be occupied, then I already have something. And if I already have hydrogen atoms, I already have a lot of mass. So you see, just to get bang, Big Bang to work, you have to have tremendous space, and that means it has to be something. Space is not nothing. Space is something. When I put my hand out here like this in the air right here, and I'm occupying that space, that space has to exist for me to put my hand into it. So you can't, I can't put something into nothing, and I can't get something from nothing. It just violates every law and rule there is. That's the article we had last week with paper, remember? Uh, it's talking about time might have evolved, and if time evolved, then maybe the laws of physics have not been constant, therefore maybe the rules were different in the past. Well, that's a total, absolute change from what the evolutionists have always said. The evolutionists have always stuck by uniformitarianism, which says that everything occurs, the rate it occurs today is the same rate it's always occurred at in the past because that's how we can get from there to here with our explanations. That's how we explain all kinds of wind erosion at uh, the Badlands of South Dakota and we get the Grand Canyon and we get petrified forest and polystratified this and that and the way we coal formation, the way we get geological layers and mountain building. All this is over in cave making, stalactites. All this is over long, long periods of time of uniformitarianism of wind or rain or drip or erosion or, you know, some kind of process. But now if we're going to change the rules, uh, it's very easy for the evolutionists to change the rules. They just change the rules and forget what they said before and go on. But you see, the scripture 
We've not been changing the rules. God used a certain set of rules, certain creation, certain principles, and it's never changed. The story of creationism has been consistent except for some liberal theologians come along and they, they get intimidated by this so-called evolutionary science like they did at the turn of the 18 to the 1900s. And they suddenly started buying into evolution as God used evolution. And they felt very sophisticated in doing that because now they could, they could explain away this hard factual science of evolution and make it in tune with the Bible. And there were some very brilliant theologians that bought into that and they really did us a disservice in the church. They really did because uh, this thing was picked up by the uh, large great schools and worked its way down to our, our seminaries and they trained our pastors in theistic evolution. Theistic evolution was brought to our churches and the next thing we were hearing, uh, the, the, uh, the Noahic flood was based on the Babylonian local flood epic and it wasn't a worldwide flood because worldwide flood is impossible. You know, yet uh, we read articles in the newspaper where the scientists are stating that uh, hey, you know, there was, there was global-wide floods on Mars that made those gigantic 100-mile-wide uh, canyons, but there's no water on Mars, but the scientists really and truly believe that there was gigantic oceans that made all those big 100-mile-wide canyons on Mars, but they don't believe that a flood could have made a canyon a mile deep and five miles wide in Arizona called the Grand Canyon. But yet they'll believe on Mars, which they have not been there, they've not seen it, they've not uh, really checked it out, now, there's no water there, but they firmly believe in this flood theory on Mars, but not for the earth, because on the earth, see, uh, the flood theory here happens to be recorded in the Bible. And if you believe the Bible, then you have to believe in a creator. If you believe in a creator in the Bible, then you are morally responsible. We are morally responsible. If we have a creator, then we are responsible. We are accountable to that creator. You see, but if it's just evolution, we're not accountable. So you can't put something in nothing. You have to have something to put something in. You can't get something from nothing. You have, it has to be there. So evolution at best can only start with something somewhere and some way or another, some of it's living. Now, if you have that, you haven't explained anything. Have you? You haven't explained where we came from. You've not explained how we got here. You haven't explained why we're here. You're not, you haven't explained, uh, you know, why that we have a conscience. You know, when we do things wrong, we usually feel some type of guilt or something until we become hardened. Then when we become hardened, we no longer feel it. But that shouldn't be an evolved thing. Why should we feel guilty if we're only acting out of evolution and survival of the fittest. And if evolution is true, then people are still evolving, and that means that one group of people somewhere is going to out-evolve all others, and that means there, there, there are some superior people around, and others are inferior to them. Therefore, what's wrong with killing inferior people? You know, if they're really inferior, what's wrong with killing out the, the elderly? What's wrong with killing out the people that are in comas? What's wrong with killing people that are, are, uh, have handicaps, that are born retarded, that all these things? What's, all we're doing is just helping evolution along with survival of the fittest. But no, we love those people. We have compassion for them unless we get hardened to them. And the scripture teaches, you know, to love our fellow man, to seek the good of others, not to seek to rise above others by survival of the fittest, but evolution is survival of the fittest, chaos. You're the strongest, you take what you want. And moral uh, ethics and conduct, there's no absolutes. We, all, we make the rules for the society as we want to live under society. So if we want to uh, totally accept homosexuality and abortion, and euthanasia, that's our right under evolution because we're, we're just animals and we're in control right now and ever how we want the rules to be, that's the way the rules will be. But see, that's not the way it is under creationism. Under creationism, we have a creator God. He has an absolute moral code. 
He has left with us scripture to tell us the principles of life by which we are to live our lives. And we don't have the right to determine what we think is right. Where is it there? Someone said Judges, the last chapter. They start doing what was right in their own eyes. And the first thing they did is they started seeking after. They wanted a king. They no longer wanted God to be their king. They wanted a, 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 a human king. You know why? So they could be like the other nations around them. Can you imagine the Israelites, God's chosen people, the people that were the, were the kingdom of priests that were supposed to take the gospel message to the world and get, it, get the world ready for the first coming of the Messiah, the first advent? They wanted to drop God as their king, and they wanted to have a king like the Canaanites and the Philistines and the Ammonites and the Moabites and the, uh, the uh, Nabataeans, which went on to become called today the Arabs, and the Egyptians. They wanted to be like the people around them. You know, I find there's a good parallel to that today uh, here in America. Us believers want to be like the other people in America. We want to dress the same, live the same, act the same, talk the same, go the same places they go, and we uh, become so calloused to this that we can't see the difference. I can remember the days, and several of y'all can't even hear, that no school would have ever thought about having any kind of ball practice or games on Wednesday night. I can remember it. I mean, the parents, they had gone to that school, and they would have just flat read the riot act to the coach, the principal, and everybody. And today, no, we will be like the world. You know, we don't want our kids to be deprived of everything all the other kids are getting and the way they're dressing and all that. Oh, man, I better watch this. I may not be teaching New Testament next fall, this fall, you know. And, uh, but I mean, I, I feel guilt about this myself. Not guilt, but I, I, I feel concerned. And you all know one of my concerns is how much dog food and cat food's on the shelves in Kroger's and Pick Pack and and uh, Kmart and Walmart. And I don't condemn people for having pets, but I'll tell you what, the amount of money we spend on dog food and cat food right here in Laurel County probably will build 100 churches in Russia and pay the pastor's salary and expenses for the church and supply them with all the literature and books and missionary needs they have, and it would take care of three or four orphanages in the state and take care of the children's hospital. Just what we spend on dog and cat food. And I, I, think, I, I think I've vastly underestimated what it would do. You know, we had a team return from China. You know, Clear Creek at one time, we had a team in China, a team in Bosnia, and a team in Russia. A little school over in the mountains now, and we had teams in those three countries. A team came back from China, and one of the team members, this last uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday in chapel, he said the thing that startled him was that we wash our cars in drinking water. We take baths in drinking water. We water our flowers in drinking water. You see what I'm saying? Our water is so pure coming out of the faucet, it's drinkable everywhere in the world. They wouldn't dream of washing a car or, or uh, putting it on flowers or any of that. So we don't even think about it. We are so blessed it's pitiful. You realize that? We wash our cars in drinking water. Well, let's get back to this creation evolution thing here. I can get off on tangents and spend about six months. But isn't this a wonderful thing right here? This balance, photosynthesis, and cellular respiration. Photosynthesis, the upbuilding of energy in green plants. And then respiration in plants and animals both, the utilization of that energy. And that, that, that system, when you study biochemistry and you study that system in detail and the biosynthetic pathways in the human body, I'm telling you, you'll, you'll then look on evolution as so superficial it's pitiful. I cannot believe, because of all the training I've had and everything, I can't believe that any reputable scientist really and truly can believe in evolution. It is their religion. It is their philosophy. It is not their scientific conviction because when you get right down to it, like a good friend of mine, uh, he, he's got as many degrees or more than I have, 
We went to school together and got our PhDs together. We've been friends for 40 years. We retired both from the military after 27 to 30 years of service and uh, had parallel careers and everything, but he's an avid evolutionist. Has been all of his life, ever since the University of Florida. And he got exposed to evolution in college. And uh, it boils down to this. When, we, when I get him right down, boiled down, we're having discussion, I throw all this evidence at him, he'll say, now, Bill, you know that no matter what you say or what you prove, I'm not going to accept creationism. I say, well, why not? He said, because I am not. He says, well, I'm going to keep evolution in spite of its weaknesses because I am not prepared to accept the only other alternate. So the only other alternate is creationism. He is not prepared to accept creationism. Therefore, he must hang on to evolutionism. A lot of the people going through the colleges and universities really never get an exposure to what y'all have been exposed to in the last 10, 12 weeks. They never hear any of that information. Never. They will never hear about Mount St. Helens the way you heard about it. They will never hear about the wave marks on the cliff out there that uh, a, a evolutionary geologist look at him and he would say it took thousands of years to make it and yet we know it was made in a few weeks. 600 foot cliff out there, brand new, wasn't there two years ago, is there today, two years later. This is uh, 1980, 1982. A 600 foot cliff laid down in nice parallel layers, just like if we go dig around here and we find a cliff somewhere and we dig and look at the rock layers, and we think, oh, that must be very, very old. You know why we think it must be very, very old? Because we've been told it's very, very old. We've not really been taught that, hey, this earth was made beautiful in Genesis 1, and before the fall, it was absolutely, totally different from this today. This is a fallen earth we live in today. This is an earth that's been scrambled up and torn all the pieces by worldwide chaos and calamity and flooding and Tsumi tidal waves and uh, gigantic water geysers coming out of the ground when the water underneath broke through and punched holes into the sky and knocked holes into the windows of heaven and the water above fell down and all this went on for many, many days and nights, killing everything except those uh, uh, fish in the water that could survive in certain little niches and things that God protected them and all everything else had to be on the ark. And see, some people feels like that's just a totally, absolutely unbelievable story. But they believe that it's believable that big floods happened on Mars and made canyons hundreds of miles wide. But they can't believe a big flood made a canyon five miles wide and one mile deep in the United States. Yet, at Mount St. Helens, there was in just a few days a, a, a canyon, a scale model of the Grand Canyon made just in a couple of days, and uh, it's a 140th model up there. It is made by rapid erosion by the breaching of a dam that was made by the eruption of the volcano, and it dammed up the river for a long time, and the river broke through, and it cut a 140th model of the Grand Canyon. We've talked about how it made the badlands of South Dakota. We've talked about how coal, first formation of coal has taken place on the bottom of Spirit Lake because of all the bark being knocked off of the millions of trees floating on the top of Spirit Lake. And uh, so there's, there's very good explanations for coal seams, rock layers. There's good explanations for uh, these tubular volcanic ash tunnels out laying on top of the ground in Arizona and New Mexico that stretch for miles and that's what a lava does when it flows under water, when it's on the bottom of a lake or an ocean or whatever, and it makes these tunnels. And uh, because it, it solidifies outside and the hot still runs through the pipe until the whole thing's completed and it quits flowing, you want these large tubular uh, deposits that are left. Well, we've talked about all kinds of things. Let's uh, now look at, uh, and uh, let's look at our comparison again. Now remember, we talked along these lines. We introduced uh, creationism and evolutionism as two religions. And that's exactly what they are because they both take faith. You can't believe in evolution without faith. You can't believe in creationism without faith. And, and immediately, one of the big things here that comes from these two philosophies or these two religions is 
how old is the earth? Now the evolutionists, they believed it was several hundred thousand years old. When I was a kid in high school, they believed it was a million years old or so. When I got into college, it had jumped up to uh, hundreds of millions. When I got to university, it jumped up to billion years, three and a half to five billion eventually. And uh, so here just after Hubble telescope, it's now jumped to 12 to 15 billion. In other words, the earth age is always changing with evolution, getting older and older and older because they need more and more time. And with Hubble telescope, they still didn't see the edge of the universe. And I think that's the dumbest thing I ever heard in my life. They're trying to invent a big telescope so they can see the edge of when it big banged and big bang is expanding. And if they could just see the edge out here and measure from where we are to the edge and do all their computations, then they will know when big bang occurred. Well, see, they thought big bang occurred about three and a half to five billion years ago because that's as far as they could see with the current telescopes they had, see. And, uh, you have to realize I'm only saying what they say they can do. I'm not particularly believing it. They got Hubble and got it fixed, and they were now able to look 12 to 15 billion, and guess what? They exceeded the capabilities of their telescope. There's still more on the other side. They just can't focus on it because their telescope's not good enough. So what do they need now? A bigger telescope at whose expense? Taxpayers' expense. So the evolutionist can seek to find out how old the universe is again. All they have to do is consult the Bible and save all that money. Because the Bible says man cannot measure God's creation. I don't care how big a telescope they get, you know what's going to happen? They're just going to see more and more millions and billions of galaxies and everything else. Do you realize the Milky Way that you don't see anymore because of air pollution and too much light pollution? But occasionally you got somewhere you can see the Milky Way. You realize that Milky Way is just one arm of our two-armed galaxy. We're like that. We have two arms in our galaxy. Earth is located in one of the, our sun is located in the arm of one of those two arms. And what we're seeing when we look up through the sky, we're looking through the arm of our galaxy. Just one arm. Do you know there's millions and millions of stars just in our galaxy? Do you know there's millions and millions of these things arranged in different ways? And it, the bigger, how bigger telescope you get, it doesn't matter. You just keep seeing them and seeing them, seeing them. I mean, you know the difference between three and a half billion and 12 billion? You know, they just throw it around like it's, oh, it's not very much. We looked up there and, oh, the Earth's, oh, it's no longer three and a half to five billion. It's now 12 to 15. You know, it's like the, they're trying to make you think it's like the difference between three to five oranges and 12 to 15 oranges. Let me tell you something. You put the zeros on it, and you'll find out how many oranges different it is. It's not a matter of a difference between 3 and 12. It's a difference between 3 billion and 12 billion. Well, we believe, believers that believe in an absolute creationism from chapter 1 of Genesis, the earth is somewhere uh, six, 7,000 years old, as best as we can tell. You cannot date the age of the earth, but we know from many, many things it, it, that uh, when you start putting it to scientific investigation, you can only come up with somewhere, like we say, between seven and 35,000. Carbon dating is only reliable up to 35,000 years. Even if you have the 35,000 years, it would only be reliable up to that. And these other things like nickel content of the ocean and helium uh, present in the atmosphere, the magnetic uh, feel of the earth and just all kinds of things all put the age of the earth at no younger than seven no older than 35 and creation evolution's two philosophies of life global flood myth or truth it's true and we pointed out many many stories and documentations for that dinosaurs and man dinosaurs coexisted with man there's probably still some dinosaurs around in the ocean japanese fishing boat 19 77, I believe it was, uh, caught a seagoing dinosaur, photographed it, measured it, but marine biologist, it was dumped back in the ocean because the captain wouldn't allow this dead animal to be brought aboard his fishing ship because that would have caused uh, the catch to be condemned only to be for dog food or fertilizer rather than for human consumption. Ice age, recent. The only way you can get an ice age is to have 
tremendous amounts of warm water having come in from underneath the earth where it's thermally warm, very suddenly, very quickly, tremendous amounts of warm water and also have volcanoes exploding and going off in such a way to put a lot of dust and debris in the air to shut off the sun's rays and to cool down the land mass. With the cool down of the land mass and warm water, you get tremendous volumes of this condensation coming up over the land mass, cooling down and falling out as ice and snow and very quickly developing big, uh, gigantic ice shelves. And uh, this is easily demonstrated uh, over at uh, Middlesbrough, like we talked about. There's a P-38 being rebuilt in the hangar over there, and they recovered that P-38 uh, 268 feet below solid ice. They had to take steam and melt the ice in tunnels to get down to that airplane uh, 268 feet deep, and it had been there since 1940-something. So just in 50 years, it had been covered up with 267, 68, 78 feet of ice. And so there's much, much other evidence that the Ice Age is very recent and that type of thing. Well, evil, it's sin. You don't evolve evil. Race, we talked about there's no such thing as race. And we talked about how that the National Academy of Sciences, a very prestigious organization, has now suddenly, in the last 25, 30 years, become so rabid for evolution that they're now indoctrinating and they're still a good organization. They're a very prestigious organization, but they have an agenda because the evolutionists have gotten in control. Evolution takes vast amounts of time they don't have. It's random chance, no guidance, no direction. It violates the laws of physics, chemistry, and biology. It's a, like a recycling thing. There's limited life. Uh, there's no accountability. Man is an animal, and it's survival of the fittest. That's what you have with evolution now. You, you can't have a divine evolution. You can't have a theistic evolution because you're getting rid of a creator. If you have no creator, you have no absolute morality. Creation, six literal days. God has no trouble knowing how long a day is before he had a son, right? S-U-N. You know, a lot of people says, how can you say it was the end of the first day when there was no son? Well, that's dumb. A God that can create Heavens and earth, it certainly knows how long a day is before he puts the sun up there. See, I don't want to uh, downplay God's abilities there. Random chance versus purpose and design. We're, we're purposefully designed. Psalms 139 says that. So if you don't believe that we're purposefully designed, you don't believe we're random chance, then you have to throw Psalms 139 out of the Bible. If you believe that vast time took place, you have to throw first and second chapters of Genesis out of the Bible. If you don't believe in a worldwide flood, you have to throw Genesis 6, 7, 8, 9 out. If you don't believe we spoke one language and God confused the language, you have to throw out Genesis 10 and 11. See, when, when we come along and not believe certain things, then we have to throw that part out of the Bible because evidently if it's not true, it shouldn't be in the Bible. And see, that's a liberal's approach. And uh, these violate laws, so does this one. The Creator established the laws. So as today, when we look back on it, to create something from nothing would violate the first law of thermodynamics. But he's the creator. We have a reason for a violation here in that he established the law after he created it when he said it's very good. And that was it. And also he showed that he was through with creating when he took a piece of flesh from Adam and he made Eve out of living cells taken from Adam. God showed that he was going to go by the rules he was setting up uh, this earth on. This one has limited time. Over here we have eternal life. No accountability, accountability to God. Man is an animal, man is in the image of God. We're in the image of God. We are eternal, we will never cease to exist. Evolutionists do not believe in the eternal soul or eternal life. Now some theistic evolutionists may say they try to, but uh, they're very confused because in evolution, we're just an animal and we're just recycling. We're, we're nothing but dirt to be recycled. And you know, some a worldwide religion uh, uh, has picked up onto that, and they have um, what they call reincarnation. You can come back as a dog or a monkey or a cow, and uh, you know, they, de they will not eat any animals or kill an animal, and they'll let the rats eat all of the corn crop up, and they'll not try to keep a rat from eating the corn crop, and the people starve to death. That's how, that's how much they believe in this reincarnation thing. And... Uh, Reincarnation is this recycling ideal up here, see? And uh, just definitely, absolutely, totally against everything that creation stands for. 
and uh, survival of the fittest as versus love of the fellow man. But we're in the image of God. We're eternal and never cease to exist. And uh, we simply, our spirit that's in our body right now, that's the eternal spirit. Our body is not eternal. It's a fallen body. We're waiting for a glorified, resurrected body. And the only way we can get that is become a believer in this life. And when our spirit departs our body in accordance with the Hebrews 9, 27, appointed unto man once to die. And then not only that, James 2, 26 says, the body without the spirit is dead. And so when my spirit departs my body, my body is dead, but that's okay. It's a fallen body. It's not a glorified body. And I will not be in some kind of soul sleep. If I'm absent from the body, I'm present with the Lord. That's in Corinthians. So when my spirit comes out of my body, I go to be with the Lord. Then it comes time for me to reunite with my physical body. There will be a resurrection of my body. It will be a glorified body, and it will be a body that has never known any sin whatsoever. You see, when man failed, man was in need of justification. Justification by the blood of Christ is what removes us from the penalty of sin. Then we're told to work out our own salvation. That means sanctification, which means to become Christ-like, to seek a holy lifestyle. And when we become sanctified by becoming Christ-like, we are removing ourselves from the power of sin over our life. And then after our spirit leaves our body, and we get our resurrected body, our glorified body, and that's glorification, and that's when we will be absolutely removed from all presence of sin, and that's the reason why God is going to destroy the heaven, the earth, and Jerusalem, and he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem, and he's going to give me a new body for my spirit to be in, and the new heaven, the new earth, new Jerusalem, and my new body have never, ever known or in the presence or have any penalty relative to sin. So that's what we have to look forward to under creationism. What do you have to look forward to under evolution? Nothing. Doom, gloom, terminal, the burnout of our star. We better get busy. We better raise taxes. We give NASA some more money. They need to get all this space exploration underway. They need to find a way for us to escape from our sun. We need to go somewhere else and take some elitists there and a bunch of evolutionists or highly educated people, elitists, you know, because they're not going to take any Bible-thumping uh, fundamentalists on these spaceships, do you think? Man, they want rid of us. They'll let us all die when the sun goes out. Boy, do they have a science fiction story. In fact, Star Wars, Star Trek, Battlestar Galactica, you know, uh, all, there's all kinds of them. This is the kind of story that's in there. I mean, remember Spock? Got killed, died, some way or another, he resurrected, went to Nirvana or something, and now he's like a god, you know. Well, gee, that's Mormonism, you know. Everybody's going to, every Mormon's going to become a god, the men are. I don't know about the women. Seems to me like the women are destined to become celestial wives and have nothing but celestial babies. So those babies can go and occupy the humans on the earth that, the, the new God is going to get. Jesus Christ is on his way to becoming the next God because he's the most successful man that ever lived. Satan, his brother, was unsuccessful, and he's so mad because Jesus got control that you know, he's trying to stir up and cause trouble for Jesus' uh, arena in, in, in this thing. You know, That's Mormonism, Jehovah Witnessism, elitist group highly uneducated elitist group. And uh, they really truly feel that it's them and them only with their 144,000. Until they got bigger than 144,000, they had a major problem. Now what happens to people that become a Jehovah Witness after the 144,000 field? Well, they had a new revelation. Our scripture teaches against new revelation, right? Teaches against new revelation, the Book of Mormon, the pearl of this and the pearl of that, and the worldwide translation uh, which is the Jehovah Witness distortion and heresy that they've come up with. And uh, they, they just manipulate everything. So now you now can be a Jehovah Witness because they've opened up the ranks to more than 144,000. Hey, they've got hundreds of millions of people that are members of Jehovah Witnesses now. they got another problem. The rules were only one of the 144,000 could ascribe to the leadership. In other words, become the leaders of the Jehovah Witness. Well... All the 144,000 have the capability to run an organization like that have died. And they're not going to turn it over to people that don't know what they're doing because what they'll do is run through all the money and Jehovah Witnessism will collapse. 
So they now need to have a new revelation, and they're going to have it. You watch it. A new revelation that someone other than a person, a member of the 144,000, can ascribe to the leadership at Brooklyn. The Mormons are going through that. The 12, the Council of 12, the apostles, they have the 12 apostles in Salt Lake City. Those guys now, Mormons are living so long. Back in the frontier days, you didn't live more than 40 or 50 years of age, so men were dying early, so they all had fresh men come into the leadership of the Mormons. Now, the leadership, the 12, the average age is over 80-some. The men are senile, a lot of them. And the leader of the Mormons, uh, if he's still the same one as there a couple of years ago, is so senile, they have to hold his hand and move it for him to sign documents. He is beyond conscious thought process. This is what you get involved in when you get involved in not having a good view of creation in the Bible and believing the biblical story. Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You know, Psalms 119. Though. Well, you have seen all these overheads before. What's it going to be like? Coming from nothing to something, from the non-living to the living, simply by chance and going from the simple to complex, survival to fittest, competitors, Man with the insects and the future, no matter who wins, the death of our star. That's evolution. Creation, a creator, he brought nothing to something. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Remember that? Barashi, bara, Elohim, uh, ha, shamayan, val, et, ha, resh. In other words, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Why didn't this just say, in the beginning, God created everything? Because everything's not equal. In the beginning, God created what? The heavens, everything else, and the earth. He made the earth special. He spelled it out. The earth is something very special. The earth is the center of the universe. Now, it's not the geometrical center of the universe. Unless we prove that, I'm not going to try to. But it is the center of God's creation. The earth is important, and the most important thing on earth are us human beings because we are in the image of God. We forget that, see? Well, that's the way it goes. Something from nothing. He brought living alive. He organized it into kinds. Even though man failed, God redeemed. Future harmony, and we're going to spend eternity either with God or without God. Every person is eternal. Whether you become a believer or not, you are eternal. You don't get eternal life just by uh, uh, salvation. You're already eternal life, but we usually call it eternally dead because eternal life, we like to sort of keep that to mean one who's been redeemed. But everybody from a moment that sperm touches that egg and fertilizes it, that is an eternal human being. Whether you abort it or not, that makes any difference. It's an eternal human being from the moment of conception. Because the moment of conception, you came into being and I came into being. Well, we're down to our time has run out. Remember evolution, given enough time. Uniformitarianism, index fossils, geological column, big bang, etc., etc. Won't stand the test of science. If evolution is true, then no creator God, no image of God, man just another animal, earth beginning chaos, no special day, no absolute moral code, and even if there's a God, he lied. I mean, that's evolution. That's theistic evolution. Secular, our sun will dim, all life forms will cease. Christian, yes, the day of the Lord will come, heaven will pass away. Great noise, elements will melt, fervor and heat in the earth also, but we're going to get a new heaven and the earth. And remember, the evolutionists say, right in the good old biology books, if you think about it long enough, it just bound to have occurred. And that's a distortion, that's a secular evolutionist paraphrase of Psalms 119.11, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. And next week, we will start talking about New Testament chronology. And then after we talk about New Testament chronology, the following week, we'll get involved with a review of Old Testament, then we'll review the intertestamental period, and then we'll talk about uh, the Gospels and the, the, the time setting and getting everything started, and we'll approach it from that point. Okay.